So what does a Panasonic GH5S camera and a household brand power tool battery have in common? The answer is absolutely f all. <sighs> Sunday morning, what better way to spend making another YouTube video? And I mean that, I'm actually quite enjoying it. So today's story is gonna be about what I did to manage my battery issue for my camera while shooting these YouTube videos and some of the uh, frustrations I had with the manufacturer provided battery. I'll give you an idea in a sec. What solution I came up with to address that issue. So in the land down under, we have these power tools from our big box hardware store, Bunnings, which I hazard a guess is very similar to the US's version of uh, Home Depot. This is a budget line of power tools, slightly higher than the Azito home brand, which is um, very, very entry level. This, these models are the red model, uh, as opposed to the gray model, is, I guess, slightly more robust and has the usual technologies you'd expect in higher end gear like our friend the Bumblebee, which I don't have it to hand at the moment. I will just go grab it. The uh, DeWalt um, cordless power tool range. Now I did initially start uh, expanding my, well I didn't really have a cordless uh, tool set, but I did uh, start out with this guy here a few years ago, um, which built this workshop, helped build this, build this workshop. but. Over time, I started growing weary about, what do you actually get for your dollar? But anyway, I digress. So I shifted to a more budget line, uh, but very capable cordless power tool. And then that meant I had to get a whole new range of batteries for, uh, to run those set, because they're not, definitely not interchangeable. So with that, I thought, okay, how can I leverage the versatility of having these batteries on charge? Because I do, I have a, probably about five or six of these of various capacities on rotation all the time. So I never find myself without a uh, charged unit ready to go. Uh, and then I got into this YouTube gig and I'm thinking after my first three or four shoots, I'm going, oh my God, the camera battery is so lame. I get 45 minutes to an hour of shooting and it's not necessarily solid shooting time. It's getting your shot prepped, getting you know, your composition right and your camera is spending most of its time in standby, not actually recording. So I'm burning batteries and I've only got one battery that came with my camera. And then for me to burn that battery, have to take it out, stop what I'm doing, go in and recharge that battery, which takes two and a half to three hours, then come back and restart what I was doing, try and pick up where I left off. It became, or it has become quite a, a chore. This range of power tool has a really unique feature. Now, let me just set up here because I'm not, I haven't got everything optimized. Let's get this one out of the way, I'm not confuse the issue. These batteries that come out are your typical 18 volt, lithium ion, fast charge, whatever, whatever, battery units. Now I've got a few of them. Here's another one here, which is a massive four amp hour. And then I've got one elsewhere. Oh yes, found it. <laughs> this puppy is a big 5.2 amp hour job. Now, excuse the big zip tie around it because I used to hang this off my um, tripod just as a weight <laughs> to get some stability. Um, these battery packs, plus a few others I've got, I've got another two amp hour and another 1.5 amp hour battery pack somewhere, um, have been extremely uh, reliable, fast charging, and they have their rated capacity as stated, and I've been checking it with my load tester. Uh, I actually might do a video on that. Uh, but they do have an inherent feature, well not inherent feature, an extra feature that I don't find with any other model of cordless power tool, and it's this little puppy. And this is a godsend because what it is, is a USB output. It's got two USB um, ports on it. One's one amp, one's 2.1 amp. And all you do is if you slide this onto your battery pack, you've got an instant power bank. And that is amazing because you've got all this capacity. You're starting at 18, 18 volts. You're um, bucking it down to five volt with two outputs and you can turn it on and you've got an instant power bank. So I thought, how could I leverage that? And expand on this and then it dawned on me how about making something to run my camera and i've got all these capacity on hand on tap 
always charged, ready to go. And all I have to do is swap out a battery, whack this on, because it's not in the tool, it'll be on the camera. And I've got hours and hours of capacity. The camera can stand in standby. I normally tether it to my iPad for remote control, so I don't have to be standing at the camera or behind the camera to compose a shot. And when I say that, here's my mini iPad, and you can see the iPad on that shot, live view. And that's how I control my camera. It's so handy. So this is my little, oh, it's a first gen mini iPad, and it's doing, this is all it does now, because it can't do much else. And that's what I use to interface my, to my camera remotely. So I can change focus on things, set up a shot, whatever. Um, but nine times out of 10, I've got my camera in standby mode while I'm composing a shot, burning the battery, the factory battery. And that is only, oh, what I'll have to do is I'll swap it out for it and show you what I've done. Now this here, I'll show you Mark 1. Now, okay, it's a bit scary, a bit Frankenstein-ish, but I am going to improve it. This was only my concept variation. And that's the same unit. Let me just pop this here. This is the same unit that's on this battery, but just modified. So all I've done is screwed a bit of Vero board to the top of it. And in the top corner here, I've lifted, um, I've entered into the, the casing and pulled out the positive and negative off, straight off the 18 volt terminals internally. So this is all still functional. All of this is still functional, but the only difference is I now have the capability to pull off the 18 volts from the battery itself. So when that slides on, not only have I got USB function for charging or powering anything, I now have I now have the capability to get 18 volts out. Let's just separate that before I melt down everything. The only thing at the moment that this output is not fused, so if anything goes awry, obviously a lot of smoke comes out. I can take a 5mm by 2.1mm DC barrel jack, pop that into that, and I've got 18 volts at my disposal to do whatever I want with. Um, I am going to replace this Vero board setup with this socket with probably just having this lead coming out the side of this box because that means I've still got all the capability and functionality originally, but I just have this extra little fly lead, well not really a fly lead, the DC barrel jack socket out the side, uh, providing me with 18 volts when and where I want to use it. And obviously I can do that to multiple units. I've got three or four of these because um, they're just so darn handy and I, I find that if I'm not charging my camera or using it to run my camera, um, I'm charging uh, my wireless microphone set, probably the iPad that I remote to my camera with. Uh, all that can be done from the same battery pack or multiple battery packs, but I'm not limited to capacity, which is great because I guess um, we'll go into the math later on how, uh, how much more time I get with these. And second to that, cost. Now, I'm just gonna swap to this battery now to run my camera, because I wanna pull the, the factory battery out of my camera now and um, discuss that. Be right back. Okay, I'll get these guys out of the way. This here is the battery that comes with the camera. Now, it's a 7.2 volt, 1860 milliamp hour, uh, 14 watt hour lithium ion battery pack. Um, like I say, for me, doing a shoot, I get, at best, probably an hour of filming with it. Um, and that hour is gonna consist of some standby, some composing of shots, because for me to turn the camera on and off while I'm recomposing a shot, it keeps disconnecting, well, understandably, disconnecting my Wi-Fi connection to my iPad. And then every time I start up, I've gotta re-establish that connection. It becomes a bit of a pain in the backside. So with that, the camera, since this is out of the camera, my camera is now running on my new solution using my power tool batteries. So the way I've done that, I'll explain shortly, but there is a bit of, well, there's no real voodoo in it. There is a little bit of consideration to keep in mind when you go down this road, because the camera is a pretty pricey piece of equipment. And the last thing you want to do is start jamming pixies in it that don't agree with it. And then we're letting the smoke out and then you've just done your investment. You've got to really, during my time developing my solution, there was a pucker factor was through the roof and I was second guessing everything and making sure I was really testing what I was doing. And um, I just wanted to be really sure that what I was going to achieve or wanted to achieve is not going to upset the camera. So this guy at the moment isn't redundant. It's mainly used just now for if I take the camera out with me and I'm away from the house. But my new solution for within the workshop, I've got capacity up the wazoo, so I don't have to worry about running out of battery anymore. Okay, so I was discussing pricing. Now, 
for me to buy a two amp hour battery for from my local big box store, a two amp hour unit will cost me, I think today's pricing is $25. Now $25 is pretty reasonable for, for a lithium ion battery pack. The Panasonic, uh, this is a DMW-BLF19E, um, which suits most of the GH series cameras, uh, probably more, but mine's a GH5S, but this fits multiple Panasonic cameras. For me to go pick one of these up today, well not today, because it's Sunday, but if I, I can drive down to a store, a physical store, and pick one of these up for about 110 koala tokens, and that, is just ridiculous. It's nearly five times the cost of this battery here. So I thought, well, bugger that. I'm not gonna pay the professional markup that they've decided to whack on this because yeah, okay, granted, the camera I'm using isn't your average point and shoot. I can't justify the markup and then having a couple of these in rotation. And on top of that, I like to be a little bit more practical and um, explore some other avenues and utilize what I already have and save costs. So that's what I've done. So looking at this power bank module, um, it's fairly simplistic and very minimalist in its um, appearance. I haven't seen any other uh, power tool brand, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I've seen so far, no other tool brand um, seems to have this, well, not that I've seen, seems to have a solution like this. Um, as soon as I saw it, it was relatively cheap too, so we're only talking about um, 12 to 13 koala tokens, and that's pretty reasonable for what what extra functionality and um, extra convenience it provides because it's just you can't really put a price on that nowadays with everything that's electronic and uh, needs power so i decided to buy a few of these little units and this is not the first time i've used this to do something other than what it's meant to do so what we're going to do now we'll open up this power bank adapter and we i'll just check Okay, yep. We'll have a look inside. And just check out what we expect to see inside. I might, I'll fast forward this part of the video. Okay, so we're in. And we can strip this right down and have a look at the general makeup of all the components. So it's fairly straightforward. In fact, it's, it's ridiculously straightforward. Um, we have our circuitry for our um, USB ports on the, on the back. We've got our on off for the USB port functionality, um, our buck converter circuitry. And I think there's a bit of protection circuitry for the USB side of things, not the battery pack because the the battery pack itself has its own internal protection circuit as well as its own battery gauge. Um, I will get into that later, but that can pose an issue to our new solution, but not major, not a major issue if you're aware of it. So we look at where the blade terminals are that interface with the batteries when we put them on. So I'll just pop this back. As you can see, that's where this interfaces with the battery pack. So we can actually do that now. And then we know that this circuit's live. So we'll take that off. And where these blade terminals are, we look at the top side and you can see where the terminations are for those blade terminals. So all we do is I take my uh, DC jack that I want to use as an interface point to the 18 volt or actually when they say 18 volt, it's actually 20 when it's fully charged. 20.6, I think. Um, you have to take into account the fully charged state of a lithium ion cell. When uh, they're marketed, they're marketed as 3.7 volts per cell. Now that's nominal voltage. It's not their fully charged state and it's not their completely depleted state. It's just a nominal voltage. It's just a ballpark. So if you're doing calculations for um, battery capacity and battery voltages, uh, try and use 4.2 volts when you're calculating maximum charge state because if you don't and you design your circuit to handle everything calculated at 3.7 you're going to find that you might end up with smoke being let out of your devices. Now these have a protection circuit where 
at 20.6 volts they are fully charged and they tend to cut out so far my testing around 15.5 to 15 volts and they the internal um, internal circuitry cuts everything out to prevent over discharging uh, beautiful feature nice feature um, but you do get a pre-warning when you're getting close to the cutoff voltage uh, not only do we when you press this the three lights diminish and your last light starts flashing but when you are getting closer to your cutout voltage this last uh, light it starts flashing automatically even without you pressing this indicator button so you you get a fair advance warning but you've got to know to look for it there's no audible buzzer or anything that's another story for later um, so just be aware that with this particular battery you do have visual cue when your battery is about to go out and you don't want this to cut out mid shoot the uh, video file you're currently recording will be corrupt because it won't have that won't have a chance to be finalized and that means uh, you won't be able to work with that file so everything you've done up to that point in that file in that recording session is completely gone so anyway this is what i tend to do so i take off the 18 volts directly off these terminals here now i i've done it with no in-circuit protection there's no fusible link or anything between this and this this plug but in the device i've now made to interface between my camera because that's another issue you've got to you've got to remember that the camera only wants 7.2 volts now remember the lithium ion nominal voltage that's it should actually be 7.4 volts because we've got two lithium ion cells in um, in series here providing 8.4 volts fully charged state so that's two times 4.2 so 8.4 volts should be this battery pack when it's fully charged um, 7.4 volts would be its nominal voltage um, and then uh, two 2.7 volts per cell um, which would be 5.4 uh, sorry yes 5.4 volts um, depleted so you don't want to go below 2.7 volts generally for a lipo battery pack <coughs> so this is the best well this is what i do I, I connect my positive and negatives to the appropriate terminals there i bore a hole in the side of the, the top case here just enough for the cables to fit through so i don't want too much um, opening or excessive um, space for crap to get in especially when you're in a workshop you don't want filings or anything getting in and sitting on top of this lot here because that's just that's just bad news and the bit of strain relief either you tie a knot in here there's a bit of room between the top of this circuit and the bottom of the the casing to have a, a little bit of strain relief floating around in there i tend to just use a very small zip tie and strangulate the cable with enough strain relief left inside the case that so that if it was tugged on you're not going to rip the, your solder connections off which is um doesn't make for a good day it'll ruin you ruin your afternoon so that's all i do and that's that provides my 18 volts and that's essentially i won't uh, work on this one anymore because i'll do that later that's essentially what i've done here now if i bring this around to the shot i don't want to unplug this because this is actually currently running the camera as you see now and you can see this is my big 5.2 amp hour battery pack it's still fully charged it's just come off the charger so it should be still fully charged now this 5.2 amp hour battery pack now on it actually doesn't have it oh it does it's on top i can't actually remove it because if i remove that now you lose everything okay let's let's work on this 4.0 uh, amp hour battery pack uh, we've got uh, 18 volt lithium ion battery pack 4 amp out 72 watt hours now you gotta remember this battery pack is only 14 watt hours so 14 into 72 you do the math we've got more capacity here than we than we need if 14 watt hours gives me 45 to um, 60 minutes of use you can imagine what this 4 amp hour battery pack is going to do for me and not only that i've got numerous battery packs on hand so I can change them out and keep going. So what better way to leverage that functionality by tapping off that 18 volts and then getting those angry pixies down to a manageable voltage level. Now I've chosen somewhere between uh, the 7.2 and the 8.4 volts because I don't, want, I don't need to have my battery status indicator on my camera showing four bars all the time. <laughs>
All I want to know is that I've got the camera at a state where it can do its business, not run out of capacity and not leave me stranded. So at the moment, my camera is doing exactly what I've asked it to. It's showing three bars on the battery indicator um, because I've done it on purpose. I've adjusted the solution to 7.8 volts. Now that solution I've turned into a fairly robust case because I had reservations on using some of the equipment on this camera. Only because I've been raiding eBay to find solutions. Now there has been a few. I'll come back shortly. So here is a Chinese buck converter. You get off eBay and it's, it's super cheap. But super cheap doesn't necessarily mean uh, super good at what it does. This essentially is what I ended up using within my solution. Now I'm going to give you a sneak peek. Well, not a sneak peek. There's my solution. Okay, that's the end result. Now it's just got one lead in and one lead out. So one lead in is from the battery pack. <coughs> Put that in the shot. Goes into this box. The magic happens. The uh, out lead goes to the dummy battery that's now in the camera. Now the dummy battery is just exactly like one of these, but there's no cells in it. It's just the means of getting these terminals where they need to be in the camera to make connection. Other than that, the whole case is empty. There's nothing. So it's just a lead running into the backside that supplies um, the voltage that you've I've created here into the camera. Now the dummy battery itself is on eBay. Um, it comes in different shapes and sizes, but essentially all it is is to delete the battery itself and just provide a way to get power in as if a battery was plugged into your camera. Sorry if I sound a bit off today. Um, I'm just getting over a massive cold. So this is a housing. Now it is a die cast um, project box. I, I, I chose this for two, one or two, or two reasons. Um, this is the only one that suited the little board PCB that I had. Now, I had some um, high quality Vero board. I had some floating around here somewhere. I'll just go grab it. So this is the um, Vero board that I used to formulate the circuit within. Now, I did use a cheap Chinese buck converter. Uh, as you see here, these are dime a dozen on eBay. The only issue really with it is the output quality. There's no way I was going to jam the uh, ripple and crap that was coming out of this unit into the camera and be comfortable with it. So there was a few steps I needed to take uh, and extensive testing also because I wanted to be 100% certain that I could get a reliable source um, of about 7.8 volts from this. Uh, it's not only just about the output voltage, it's about the quality of that voltage as well, the quality of that output, which needs to be needed to be considered. I ended up achieving exactly what I wanted, but not without a few hours of experimentation, um, a lot of scope work, and, and and stuff like that. So uh, I'll, I'll take you through the basics of what I what I achieved. Um, I can go into detail, more detail later. By no means I did any mathematics on this. There was no formulas. There was no uh, calculations on what I wanted to achieve. It was purely based on results from a scope and exper experimentation. I was aiming for a current delivery of at least 1.5 amps. Now the camera doesn't need that. It, it needs probably less than half of that. But the reason why I wanted to test it to 1.5 amps is because as load changes on a power supply, especially a switching power supply, so does the amount of ripple. And I wanted to make sure that ripple through the whole current range um, an acceptable level uh, and it wouldn't affect the camera or its performance because it's not a battery, uh, not, it's not DC straight from the battery, which you can't get any cleaner really from a ripple perspective from a, a DC source such as a cell. So this was my best efforts to clean up the output of this. Uh, it's rated to three amps, um, but there's a bit of math involved because it's not just, it's not as simple as that. Um, the, I uh, believe it's the, the switching IC is an XL4015. Now, if I have that data sheet, I'll throw it up and probably voice over anything I might have missed here. 
and yeah, like I say, it, this power supply claims to be rated to the three amps output, but that, that's dependent on a few factors. It's not as, like I said, it's not as clear cut as that. So this, this circuit was grafted to a Vero board pretty much like this. The reason why that needed to happen is because there was on this side, as you'll see in a minute when we open this up, a load of filtering. And that filtering was just to tidy up the output voltage, the output current from this power supply because quite frankly, what I saw coming out of this was disgusting and there's no way in hell I was gonna put that into the camera. Um, so I rated all my PCBs and spare boards that I've collected over the years and garnished a load of, this is not exactly the same components, but I can tell you this is close to what I used. A load of chokes, uh, common mode chokes, in fact, that's not far off what I used. Um, output filters and all that sort of business. Now, I went down the uh, LC filtering path, not RC, because quite frankly, RC filtering doesn't, isn't conducive to high current delivery. It's very good for signaling and producing clean uh, voltage for signals, but not outright power delivery. The only way you can really achieve good power quality is um, chokes or um, inductive filters and capacitors. Now, I didn't just use uh, inductive chokes, I used um, a series of capacitors as well. And this board, the Vero board that I chose, fits perfectly, with a little bit of sanding on one side, fits perfectly inside the, uh, the, the box, this, this project box. And the reason why I use die cast is EMI rejection. Anything interfering with the circuitry inside um, and obviously anything outside of the box that might get interfered with um, is all contained within this die cast box. I could have used plastic. Plastic would have been a lot cheaper, but I didn't feel comfortable with plastic. Two reasons. It doesn't reject EMI or radio interference or uh, it's not as durable and I really wanted something that was durable and I didn't really need to touch again um, and offered enough protection and robustness to my project because uh, this is going to be a long-term thing. It may need servicing down the track. I might find better you know, switching devices, uh, switching power supplies that I could use, uh, anything like that. There's a lot to consider. There's a lot that I consider. I probably over-consider things, but for me, a camera of this caliber, I couldn't take the chance and, and provide substandard um, quality power to it. So let's open this up now. Uh, I'll remove the camera, uh, remove the cameras, remove the screws off camera and um, we'll pop this open and have a look. So I've loosened all the, all the, the screws and I'm just about to pop the lid off. Now this lid is also unique in a way that it has a wizard seal gasket. Oh, that's actually quite tight. Why is that so tight? Definitely don't want it to come off. Oh, there we go. And there we go. And the gasket's decided to come out of the lid. Well, that's disappointing. So you can probably see there, this is the underside of the Vero board. And you can see that, that it is the same, essentially the same Vero board. I'm just going to remove that gasket because that's triggering me. I'm going to put it back into the lid before it gets out of shape. Be right back. Okay, so the um, the board it's, the board is tucked in there quite tightly. It's it sits on top of the vertical uh, board supports that are actually cast into the the box itself. And I thought, well, that's quite handy because that makes for um, a good platform to sit the board on. Now, the inside of the lid, because of the proximity to the base of the circuit board, now you can pro I don't know if you can tell but none of the circuit protrusions come past the top of this box. Uh, but just to be doubly sure, I insulated the inside of the lid with some electrical tape and these two foam pads, all that does is provide a pressure on the board to keep it well seated inside the box and it doesn't migrate towards the end of the, um, you know, I am forgetting too that <laughs> I'm mucking around with this circuit and it's actually running my camera. So, <clears throat> Keeping all that in mind, that I will now switch to my standard battery because I don't want to be poking around in 
poking around in here um, and causing all sorts of interference to the camera. So I'll do that now and uh, I'll be back shortly. Okay, so I'll switch to the camera battery for now, just while I'm poking around in here. So what I uh, was explaining earlier is that, uh, yeah, all the mechanical side of things is embedded in the lid just to keep everything um, seated. This just actually does press fit into the box. And then you can see on the underside what I've um, tried to achieve to clean up the output of this cheap Chinese switching buck converter. It's, from first glance, it is definitely, uh, can be perceived as overkill, but I shit you not, the, um, the output I've got from this filtering uh, stage is just unbelievably clean. From, from what I could get, hope to get from anything from this, from robbed parts, from a, other PCBs, a Chinese buck converter, and various capacitors. The capacitors are brand new that I've used out of my stock, but the inductors and chokes and, and um, common mode chokes and inductors, I should say, are completely salvaged from parts. I've pulled down old printers and, and photocopiers and whatnot, and got the, I knew those parts would come in handy at some point. And the, the ripple voltage out of the output stage of the Chinese butt converter is, oh, I shouldn't say Chinese butt converter because all it is, is the data sheet implementation of the uh, XL4015 uh, switching IC. That's all it is. It's just using cheaper parts, that's all. The output voltage has ripple on it of about half a volt. So we're looking at about 500 millivolts ripple. And there's no way that I was comfortable throwing that into the camera. And I, I hadn't really changed or hadn't really analyzed the effect of that ripple over uh, a wide current range from zero to 1.5 amps. So I thought, no, nah, I'm not gonna deal with it. I'll, I'll run it through um, a, a filter stage and work on adjusting different things here to get the ripple to a, a sort of, you know, a acceptable level. And I've managed to settle on a ripple voltage output of about 10 millivolts. And I am 100% stoked with the result. And it only, it, it cost me a couple of dollars for um, a switching uh, buck converter and a couple of capacitors oh, and a vero board. So the whole project itself, minus the time put into it, investigating different um, filtering methods, um, I think, I'd have to say, 20 bucks for the box, granted, um, three or four dollars for the switching um, converter here, um, multitude of rob parts from stuff I've broken down over time. Uh, I'd have to say, $40 and that yields an acceptable output. Um, I'm going to have to stop my video because my son's decided to start drumming and his bedroom window is just outside my workshop. So I'll be back later.